I'm sure that all of us at one time or another in our lives have been at the graveside of a loved one. And in the midst of the liturgy of the funeral, we've seen the minister take a handful of sand and sprinkle it on the coffin and use the traditional words, dust to dust and ashes to ashes. Now, of course, that ceremony communicates something of importance, that we come from the earth and we return to the earth, and yet it's not the whole story, is it? The very name of this course of study uh, points us in another direction, that the purpose of God for those whom He has shaped from the dust and those whom He has redeemed is not that they should simply return to the dust again forever, but the progress is from dust to glory. And it's extremely important for us as Christian people to to maintain a taste of the glory that God has laid up in heaven for His people. The Apostle Paul wrote in these words, he said, For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And he spoke in rapturous terms of of what it means for the Christian to enter into his glory, to enter into the presence of Christ. Uh, To die is gain precisely for that reason. And then elsewhere Paul said, I'm a straight between two things, to depart and be with Christ, which is far better or to stay here and minister to you, which is more needful. And so again and again, the perspective that we find from the saints of the Scripture is that when we make the transition from this world to the next, we're not going into the dark depths of Sheol, but we are entering into a state of being that is far greater than anything that we can enjoy in this world. But Jonathan Edwards once made the observation that we tend to be like travelers who have longed to take a vacation in an exotic place. And in order to travel to this paradise island or wherever it is we have wanted to visit, we have to have a stop in an inn or a hotel along the way. And Edwards asked this question, what person in their right mind, if they had dreamed of this marvelous vacation spot, would get to the inn to which they travel the first day and decide to spend all of their vacation time there rather than going on to their final destination? But he said, that's the way we tend to be about this world. We cling to it. We would rather bear those ills that we have than fly to others that we know not of, as Shakespeare indicated. But we need to keep in front of us the destiny and the hope of our faith. And that's why we're going to conclude our overview of the Scriptures by turning to the book of Revelation to chapter 21 where we get that portion of the vision of the Apostle John of the new heaven and of the new earth. John says in chapter 21, verse 1, And now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. I find that fascinating, that the very first thing he mentions about the new heaven and the new earth is the absence of the sea. Now, for people in this culture, that doesn't sound very glorious, because many of us have as our highest point of destination for our vacation is to go to the sea. We enjoy the surf and the sand and and the experience of boating and all the rest. We and to love the sea. But remember that these words were written in Israel. And in Hebrew poetry, the image of the sea traditionally 
was the image of destruction and of conflict and of pain. The Jewish people never had a navy. They never developed a coastal trade because their shoreline was too hazardous and rocky. And yet all that they got from the sea were the terrible winds that came off the Mediterranean that brought havoc to their crops and the marauders that came from uh, Tyre and Sidon, the Phoenicians, and especially from the Philistines. And so the Bible speaks about the sea roaring and raging and being troubled. And so in Hebrew poetry, the river, the stream, the well, those are images of life and of blessedness because in an arid desert region, the oasis is the station of life itself. But the sea for the ancient Jew was only trouble. And so now when John looks into the heavens and he sees the new heaven and the new earth, he says, and there is no more sea. What he means is that there's no more threat of tumultual upheaval and conflict and destruction such as we have tasted in this world. Then he said, then I, John, saw the holy city the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and He will dwell with them, and they shall be His people. God Himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Sometimes we hear a message like this and our immediate response is, it's simply too good to be true. If we were to invent a religion Surely we would want to invent one that gave us a promise of some kind of permanent relief from pain and from suffering and from death. We have the image in Greek literature of the sword of Damocles that hangs suspended in the air, ready to fall and drop at any second. And the sword of Damocles represents a constant source of threat that will destroy our happiness. Now, we are creatures who are alive, and we love life. And yet, every one of us is on death row. Every one of us is under a death sentence. Every one of us knows that somehow there in the future, awaits our execution. We don't know what form it will take. We don't know what the circumstances of our own demise will be. But that sword of Damocles, that sword of death, hangs over us and casts a pall over all of our plans and our joyous anticipations. And though we try to suppress it, it's always there the awareness of our mortality. It kind of dampers the thrill and the joy of life, does it not? To have this unknown specter of the unwelcome visitation of the angel of death into our lives. Well, here we are told that there is a moment in history when that last enemy will be destroyed. For in glory, death will be no more. Now, as I said, we could see this simply as the wish projection of people who simply cannot bear the burden of this sword of Damocles that hangs over the neck of every human being. 
But it isn't just whistling in the dark that we're concerned with here. There is a reason, as the Scriptures tell, tell us, for the hope that is within us. We have already tasted glory. For in the record of the biblical Scriptures, we have the testimony of one who has already defeated death, one who has been there, done that, and come back, and has promised that he is the first fruits of all of those who fall asleep. That's fundamental to the biblical affirmation of Christian faith. Resurrection, the resurrection of the Christian following the pattern of the resurrection of Christ. It's not simply that Christ was raised for His own vindication, but He was raised as God's promise and demonstration of the surety of that promise that we will also participate in that resurrection. We are told in this picture, God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Now, I often refer to this text with this illustration. When I was a little boy, I would uh, go out and play and get scuffed up, fall down, bump my head, whatever, and I would cry. And whenever I started to cry as a little infant. I still remember that the first words that came into my mind as a child were, I want my mother. <laughs> I don't think that I was unique in that desire. And so whenever this would befall me as a child, I would make a beeline for our home and for the kitchen because there I could find my mother in the kitchen with her apron tied around her waist. And she was always so tender with me that when I would come in crying, she would hug me, and then she would bend over and she would take the corner of her apron and she would wipe away my tears. And then she would kiss me on, on the cheek and say, everything's going to be all right. I don't think there are too many things that take place in the transaction of love between human beings than for one human person to wipe away the tears of another human being. I've been with grown people, adults, in their times of pain, in hospital beds, where I have had the the privilege to lean over the bedside and wipe away a tear. There is something incredibly intimate, personal, and tender about that human activity. And I always was comforted when my mother literally, physically wiped away my tears. But guess what? Though that human action that soothed me for the moment, put a stop to my tears then, it was never permanent. The next day I might come back to the kitchen and have to get my tears wiped again. And I still have tears that wet my cheeks. And my mother's not here to wipe them away. But the imagery that we are reading here in the text of the book of Revelation is this, that when God condescends to wipe away your tears, He only has to do it once. When God wipes away your tears, they are gone forever. And John says, after God wipes away the tears, there is no more sorrow and there is no more weeping. For behold, God says, 
I make all things new. And that's what we're looking for. The recreation, the renovation, the renewal of heaven and earth. The redemption of the old. It's not the destruction of the old, but it's the reclaiming of the old, the renewing of the old, the perfection of the old, the glorification of the old. Now, what else does John see here? He said to me, write, for these words are true and faithful. This is Jesus speaking to John. He's saying, John, write this down. I'm not revealing this simply for your singular benefit, for your private edification. I want you to write it down so that my people in every age and in every place will know that these words that I have spoken and these things that I have shown you are true and faithful. You can count on them. You can rely on them. And he said to me, it is done. For I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. In verse 9, one of the seven angels who have the seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues came to me and talked with me, saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the Lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. From dust to glory. The old Jerusalem was a city of dust that was reduced to the dust. But the new Jerusalem, is adorned as a bride with the glory of God. Then what follows is a detailed description of that glory. I don't have the time to go into each element of it, and I hope that you will look at this for yourself, but just get a taste of it here when he says, having the glory of God, her light was like a most precious stone, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. She had a great and high wall with 12 gates and 12 angels and so on. And the wall had 12 foundations. The city is laid out as a square, and it gives the measurements. And then it says, the construction of its wall was of jasper, and the city was pure gold, like clear glass. And the foundations were adorned with all kinds of precious stones, jasper, sapphire, chalcedony, emerald, sardius, chrysolite, beryl, topaz, and so on. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Each individual gate was of one pearl. Imagine a single pearl big enough to serve as a gate to a city. Here's where we get the expression, the pearly gates. And the street of the city was pure gold, like transparent glass. Well, as I've said when we look at the book of Revelation, we find in here a style of literature that makes use of uh, vivid images and symbols that are drawn from all different sections of sacred Scripture. And we need to be careful not to enforce uh, too strict a literalness to these symbols that are being used. But let me suggest something to you. A symbol's function is to point to a reality beyond itself. And the 
reality to which a symbol points is always more intense than the symbol that points to it. So that if these images were of unspeakable beauty and ineffable glory, can you imagine what the reality will be? Well, we really can't. Although sometimes I, I wonder, sometimes I think, you know, I wouldn't put it past God to take us to a city whose streets were really paved with gold. Not tar, not macadam, no potholes, but pure gold. Gold that is translucent. Gold that is like glass. But I think he saves the best of the description of this place for what follows. Verse 22, but I saw no temple in it. Uh-oh, wait a minute. This could be a crushing blow to the spirit of a Jewish believer. No temple in heaven? The temple is the place that we have loved and longed for. It's there that we've experienced a certain closeness to God. The temple has represented the presence of God in the midst of His people. How can we be happy in heaven if there's no temple there? John said, I didn't see a temple. For the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. You see, the temple is simply an outward manifestation of the reality of God Himself. It's the symbol. And the symbol is replaced by the reality. The city had no need of the sun or of the moon to shine in it. Now, what kind of a place is this in the new heavens and the new earth where there is no sun and there is no moon? Think of what the sun does for this planet. Not only does the sun provide light, but it also provides warmth. Blot out the sun and you have a planet that turns to ice and to pure desolation. And even the ice would harden in the blackness of a forsaken place. But he doesn't say there wasn't any light there. It says there isn't any sun. There isn't any moon. Because there doesn't need to be a sun. And there doesn't need to be a moon. Because he says what? For the glory of God illuminated it, and the Lamb is its light. I want to go there. I want to go to the place where when you walk in, the brightness and the brilliance is so intense that it is brighter than the sun that we experience in this world, and understand that the radiance that we're beholding there that is being reflected in the streets of gold and the gates of pearl and the precious stones that adorn the city, all of this is being illumined by the radiance of the glory of God and of the Lamb. Again, people, as we have seen throughout the history of redemption, here and there, get a glimpse when the glory of God breaks through as the angels experienced on the plains outside of Bethlehem, as the disciples experienced at the Mount of Transfiguration, as Moses tasted on Mount Sinai. Now there will be a never-ending, unceasing display of the glory of God. If there were a sun there, you wouldn't notice it because it would be dwarfed by the intensity of the light that flows from the being of God Himself. 
And there is a river there. And that river nourishes the trees that are planted by its way, whose leaves are for the healing of the nation. And war will be no more. It's a taste of glory. But it is the glory for which we were made from the dust. It is the glory that is the destination of all who put their faith in Christ. No, we don't say dust to dust, ashes to ashes, as the end of the story. We say dust to glory. That's the story.